Hey everybody, welcome to Harvest, I'm Bobby. I'm Billy, and we're so excited you're here today. Can we just, for today, everything just be Easter? Can we just talk all Easter? <laughs> all Easter, all the time, because it is coming. It is, and let's start with the Easter Egg Factory. That's right. We had our very first Easter Egg Factory last year, and it was the best. It was so much fun, and so we're bringing it back this year. Your kids and your family, they get to experience the life cycle of an Easter Egg, and it is like a Willy Wonka type experience where they will end up with their very own carton of eggs and a golden Easter Egg. It's so much fun. It's been fun to watch. I'm so excited we're doing it again. All right, now Easter services. Yeah. When? How many? What's going on? Give All the Give me the scoop. So the Easter Egg Factory will be happening on Saturday, April 8th from 2 to 5. We're also going to be having some really fun stuff outside, face painting, food trucks, um, animals like petting zoo and stuff. So that's going to be awesome. That's Saturday. And then on Sunday, just for Easter Sunday, we are going to be having a 9, a 1030, and a 12 o'clock service so that we can celebrate everything that Jesus has done for us. We can't wait, and we hope you're going to invite your friends. Now, with all these Easter festivities, we never really have enough candy. We are so grateful for the individually wrapped candies that you guys have brought, but we can always take more. You can do that here on Sunday mornings or even throughout the week. Yep. Listen, Easter really is one of our biggest times for outreach and evangelism and inviting people in. And so any way that you can help, whether that's with our Easter services, the Egg Factory, or by donating candy, we are so appreciative. Speaking of your generous giving, you can keep giving generously through tithes and offerings. You can. That's right. If you want to partner with everything that God is doing here at Harvest, both here, near, and far, then you can give using the number on the screen, online, or the envelope in your program. We're so glad you joined us today. We will see you next week. Bye, y'all. Good morning, Harvest Church. We're so excited you came to worship with us this morning. We want to welcome you to stand up. Let's celebrate Jesus together. Amen.
exhausted, my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. I've decided I'm not giving up, cause you won't give up on me, you won't give up on me. season you keep repeating your promises to me now there's no stopping what you have started until it is complete when my mind says i'm not good enough god you're enough for me I've decided I'm not giving up Cause you won't give up on me You won't give up on me Sing it out Your love is holding on and it won't let go I feel it breaking out like an echo Your love is holding on and it won't let go called This Is The Way, and today Jim is talking to us about being a believer and being a disciple. They can be the same thing, but not necessarily. We want to be sure that we are disciples, that we were walking in the way, the way, this is the way of Jesus. Hey, if you would take out this little card, this is such a great tool for us. It helps us know how we can pray for you, how we can partner for you, uh, partner with you, but it also has some great things that you can do to take a next step as we prepare for Easter. Last year, we did the Easter Egg Factory. You may remember if you were around, we had 1,500 kids come through, and we got to share the message of Christ with them, and then they go through the whole little egg factory, and they get eggs and candy. Well, a bunch of ways you can help us with that. We need candy, or you can donate towards the whole thing, but that's a lot of candy because we're expecting 2,500 children this year. So ways that you can participate is to volunteer that Saturday. We're going to have the egg uh, factory going on as, long, as well as stuff outside. We've got things going on um, Sunday, of course. Parking team is a place where we need some folks. Class 101, where we talk about what it means to be a believer and what it means to be a member here at Harvest. It doesn't sign you up to be a member, but it gives you the information. Will be the Sunday after Easter, which is April 16th. You can sign up there. 
And maybe you have recently made a decision for Christ or one of your children have, or you want to recommit your life to Christ. We're going to have an outdoor, the first outdoor baptism service of the year on May 7th. So all of that you can indicate on this little card, as well as if you make a decision to follow Christ today. So I hope that today you came with an expectant heart. You didn't just come to kind of take in a nice little show, the music, the talk, but that you came expecting to meet Jesus here. Did you do that? Yes. So, Lord, we just give this time to you. We open ourselves up, speak to our minds, speak to our hearts, so that we can leave differently than we came in. Stand up and greet the folks around you today. We're so glad you're here.
muita mudança de maneira que possível. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Harvest. If you're wondering why everybody said yeehaw around you, it's our way uh, here at Harvest. It's kind of a Southern way of saying, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Is it raining outside? Anybody get wet? Well, you're here anyway. You made the time change, and you came in the weather. Hey, good job, everybody. I'm glad that you're here. Those of you watching at home, I mean, welcome to you too, I guess, but you know, you're not here, so... Welcome to everybody. We're talking about uh, in this series, it's called The Way. And we're looking at, okay, what's the way that we should live? And, and the early Christians, the early followers of Jesus, they were actually called followers of the way even before the name Christian stuck. And that comes from where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody can come to the Father except through me. And what we're doing in this series is we're kind of walking through the book in the New Testament, 1 Peter. Peter was a disciple, he was an apostle, he was a follower of Jesus, and he writes this book to help other people see, during a time of persecution, by the way, to help other people see, this is the way you should live as a Christ follower. This is the way you should live as a Christian. Now, I mentioned the word disciple a minute ago. A disciple, sometimes when you think about the word disciple, you think about back in Jesus' day, wearing sandals on a boat on the Sea of Galilee. But a disciple simply means a student, a follower, and somebody that specifically wants to be like their teacher. Now here's, I don't mean this as a trick question, but in America, sometimes it, we've made some distinctions. Is, let me ask you this. Is there a distinction? Is there a difference between a disciple and a Christian? What do you think? Here, here's why it's kind of a trick question. There shouldn't be. Okay? So here's the thing. If we're going to be a Christian, that means we are a disciple. But I got to say, in, you know, in America, we've kind of made different degrees. It's like, I mean, I go to church, I try to be a good person, I do this, I mean, I'm a Christian. And then several years ago, I guess, in, in the political arena, they added born again. Were you a Christian? Yeah, yeah. Well, are you a born again Christian? It's the same thing. You, you become a Christ follower by being born again. You become a disciple. But listen, sometimes what we kind of say, we, we have these different degrees in, in our mind. And listen, I'm so glad that you're here. I'm glad, I'm glad everybody's here. And, and Harvest is a safe place to check out what God is saying, to check out who God is, what it means to follow Jesus. But listen, I want to give you full disclosure. I want you to take a step from being just a church attender to being a disciple somebody that wants to follow Jesus and wants to be like their teacher. You wanna be a disciple? Any, anybody here? Okay, I do. I wanna be a disciple. I wanna follow Jesus and I want you to do that as well. Peter writes about that and he says, this is the way. This is the way of the disciple. This is the way a, a Christian handles this. This is the way a disciple handles certain issues. And we're gonna be looking, if you have your Bibles, you may wanna go ahead and flip over. We're gonna look at 1 Peter chapter two and I'm gonna read in a few minutes, verses 11 through 25. In this passage, Peter hits on three key issues. And they're both, uh, it's kind of a ther thermometer of spiritual maturity. I'll go ahead and tell you what those three are. It's temptation, they're there on your outline, authority, and suffering. And Peter talks about this, and we kind of can look and we can kind of gauge, how do I do with temptation. 
How do I react to authority? How do I handle when I'm going through a hard time and when I'm going through uh, suffering? You'll see kind of on the middle of the plate page, you already know this, right? The difference between a thermometer and a thermostat, right? A thermometer, if you're sick and they wanna see if you have a fever, if you're lucky, they put it in your mouth, right? A thermometer tells your temperature. It doesn't do anything about your temperature. It just says if you have one. It tells what it is. You probably have on your wall uh, several of these at home. You've got a thermometer and a thermostat, right? The thermometer tells you what it is, what the temperature in the room is. The thermostat helps you change the temperature. So when Peter's talking, he doesn't use thermometer and thermostat. Those hadn't been invented. But Peter is saying, listen, how you handle temptation and authority and suffering, that's gonna be a pretty good gauge about your spiritual maturity. But then if you look and see, man, I blow it every time with temptation. If you say, I really am terrible at this, here's the thing, you can change the thermostat. So we're gonna be looking at that. Let me read this to us. This is 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're gonna, I'm gonna read to us verse 11 through the end of the chapter, verse uh, 25. You ready for it? Here it comes. Dear brothers and sisters, you are foreigners and aliens here. Now, isn't that an interesting way to start it? Off. Is anybody from another country besides the U.S.? Raise your hand. Is anyone from another planet uh, by any chance? Okay. But it's still, we're, he's saying, you as Christ's followers are foreigners and aliens here. Then he says, so I warn you to keep away from evil desires because they fight against your very souls. Be careful how you live among your unbelieving neighbors. Even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will believe and give honor to God when he comes to judge the world. Verse 13, listen to this. For the Lord's sake, now he's gonna begin to talk about authority. For the Lord's sake, accept all authority. The king is head of state, the officials he has appointed. For the king has sent them to punish all who do wrong and to honor those who do right. Verse 15. It is God's will that your good lives should silence those who make foolish accusations against you. God's will. You're not slaves. You're free. But your freedom is not an excuse to do evil. You are free to live as God's slaves. Show respect for everyone. Love your Christian brothers and sisters. Fear God. Show respect for the king. Then he's about to talk about suffering. You who are slaves must accept the authority of your masters. Now, listen, I know we don't have a uh, slavery today. That, that's terrible. It's a terrible thing. But how many of you have bosses? You've had bosses. How many of you have ever had a really bad boss? I'm checking to see if any of my staff are raising their hands right now. Okay. <laughs> listen to what he says. The principle is the same. Do whatever they tell you, not only if they are kind and reasonable, but even if they are harsh, even if you have a jerk boss. For God is pleased with you when, for the sake of your conscience, you patiently endure unfair treatment. Wow. Do you pay, don't, you don't have to answer this aloud. Do you patiently endure unfair treatment? That's hard, right? Of course, you get no credit of being patient if you're beaten for doing wrong, but if you suffer for doing right and are patient beneath the blows, God is pleased with you. This suffering, listen to this, is all part of what God called you to. Yikes. You're called to suffer. Christ, who suffered for you, is your example. Follow in his steps. He never sinned and he never deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted. He didn't get on Facebook and trash the other people. He did not threaten to get even. He left his case in the hands of God 
who always judges fairly. He personally carried away our sins in his own body on the cross so we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. You have been healed by his wounds. Once you were wandering like lost sheep, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. This is the way. This is the way Peter says, here's how you should handle temptation. Here's how you should treat authority. Here's how you should deal with suffering. Top of the next page, let's talk about this. So, um, well, before you turn the page, so on the take the temperature, this is just a little self inventory. And let me, let me say, I wouldn't circle it with your pen, just do it in your mind. Cause like your wife looks over at you and you, you how do you deal with temptation? You put a two, she, she's gonna wanna hear about that on the drive home, you know what I'm talking about? But you just do a little self-evaluation. Uh, how do you do? Do you always fall for the same old trap? Do you always fall for the same old sin? Are you easy prey or do you run away? And then think about this, how do you respond to authority? Some of you have had some hard stories, and so maybe you're like, you flinch with any kind of authority. Do you have an attitude on the lower end of the scale? Nobody tells me what to do. Nobody bosses me. Nobody's gonna tell me how to live my life. Or are you doing good with it, and you have a, an ideal, and uh, you're, you have confidence, not just in yourself, but you have confidence in God. So you're mature, you're secure. Insecure people are always demanding their rights. Mature people, people of the way, sometimes just are quiet and they take it. How do you react to suffering? That's the hardest one. Do we cry and whine or do we see it as a time to grow? So that's just a little thermometer. Now I wanna talk about the thermostat. So what you can do about it. If you scored low on these things, don't get discouraged, don't beat yourself up because you can do something about it. So what does Peter say? Here's what goes in the first blank. How should we? What do disciples? How do disciples, are, how are we to deal with temptation? Say it with me. Run away. That's what goes in your blank. Run away. You may wanna write this in some white space. Sometimes you need to change location, you need to change your habits, and you need to change your friends. Sometimes you need to change, make some changes in your life. You need to move out of the location from the things that are tempting you. Look at this in 1 Peter 2, 11 again. We read this. Dear friends, I warn you as, if you have your pens, I want you to underline or circle this. Temporary residents and foreigners. Sometimes it says aliens. You're not of this culture. Keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Now, this is an interesting verse, and um, Jennifer's doing some other things, but I always laugh at this. This is a verse I use with funerals when I do a funeral, when someone, someone dies. By the way, I only have one funeral sermon. So uh, Jennifer said, you better, if I die before you, you better get a different one, because she's heard, heard that one so many, many times. But you may think, that this is a weird verse to use at a funeral. Why, why do I say it? L let me go back and say, all funerals are sad, but some are tragic. If, if a Christ follower dies, when a Christ follower dies, that's sad because we're gonna miss them. We love them. But it's not tragic because they're going to heaven. What's tragic is when you don't know where that person's going or you know that person was not a Christ follower. Then it's the saddest thing in the world. It's the tra most tragic thing in the world. So when I do this at funerals, I'm reminding us that are Christ followers. We, you, you and me, if we're disciples, if we're following Jesus, we are temporary residents on this earth. We are temporary residents. We're aliens, we're foreigners on this planet. You should have a green card to be here. It, it, in some ways, it would be helpful when we become Christians if we were handed a green card and it would remind us we are temporary. We got a work permit. We got a life permit. We can stay here a little while, but this is not our home. Have I told you I'm going to be a granddad? I know I mentioned it in every sermon uh, recently. I'm going to have a little 
grandbaby boy. I'm so excited, but I'm a little aggravated. You know why I'm aggravated? My kids, my daughter and her husband, live in Barcelona, Spain right now. How dare they move that far away from me? Who do they think they are? And guess what? The baby is going to be born in a foreign country. The baby is going to be born in Spain. Now, I'm going over there, but it still aggravates me a little bit. It's like, why aren't they here? That child is going to be born in a foreign land. And for the time he lives there, he's going to be a foreigner. He's going to be a temporary resident. He's going to be an alien. You know why? Because this is his home. And Peter reminds us, listen, if you're a disciple, if you're a follower of the way, this is not your home. Because this is earth and this is broken. Did everybody say they were, how many of you were born here? Like on the planet, okay? It's really weird, but even though we were born here, by the way, check, if somebody didn't raise their hand, check that out, you know, we maybe have some real aliens here. Even though we were born here, the Bible says, this is not your home. This is a temporary residence. Now, it's so easy to get caught up in culture, isn't it? Because this is the only home that we've known. This is the only life that we've known. But Peter says, this is not your home. So keep away from temptation. Keep away from the things that trip us up. I told you I have one, <laughs> I have one uh, funeral service. And uh, I vary it with, with the individual depending on how much I how well I know them etc and we try to get family members to share but I, I thought it might be nice for you to hear at least part of the in case I do your funeral here's what I'm going to say okay you get to it because if I'm doing your funeral you're not hearing it you're having a party uh in heaven uh but but us here so I tell this story I read that scripture about being we're foreigners and a funeral is a great time to remember right this life is not all there is and I tell a story, I read it a long time ago, and it's just always stuck with me about this point. Here's the story. You want to hear it? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to tell it at your funeral, probably. An old missionary from Africa, old man, was returning home to America. And he was returning home by ship. And this was back in the day where um, people traveled by ship, not just go on cruises, but they, they traveled. So it was probably in the, like, 1800s. And he was coming home sad, kind of broken, wondering if his life had had meaning because he'd, he'd spent his whole life on the mission field, but he had paid a lot. His wife died there. She was buried in Africa. His only child died there and was buried in Africa. And he was coming home but there was nobody to meet him. And it turns out that on the ship was a hero, maybe a war hero, somebody that was just declared a hero. And when they got in port to New York City, they told all the people, we want you guys to hold back. We're gonna let the hero go first because there's a red carpet, there's a, a band, and there's a ticker tape parade to celebrate our hero's return home. The old missionary was sequestered with all the other passengers and they waited for the hero to get off and the band struck up and the ticker tape parade came and the shouting. And the old missionary said, I started to complain to God. And I said, God, this is a terrible homecoming. For me, I gave my whole life on the mission field. I tried to follow you. My wife died over there. My child died over there. There's nobody to meet me here. There's no red carpet for me. There's no band playing for me. There's no ticker tape parade. There's nothing to, to welcome me home. God, have you even forgotten about me? And then he said, the Spirit of God whispered to him. Has this ever happened to you? And the Spirit said, but son, 
you're not home yet. I hope that gives you chill bumps. Friends, when a Jesus follower dies, you don't leave home, you go home. Amen? This life, this world, don't become too much a part of it. You are foreigners, Peter says. This is the way. You are aliens. You are temporary residents. So live your life like that. How do you deal with temptation? You run away. You change your location. You change your habits. You change your friends. You do what you need to do to say, okay, what? This is not my home. My home is in heaven. This is where I am temporarily. Here's number two. So how should we respond to authority? Peter says, this is what goes in your blank, with respect. This is the way that this disciple does it. Now look at this. For the Lord's sake, would you circle those two words, for the Lord's sake? Submit to all human authority, whether the king is head of the state or officials he has appointed. How's a disciple supposed to live in the 21st century? How are we supposed to respond to government? We have laws, we have officials, we have elected officials. I'm glad we live in a country where we can elect our officials. How do we respond to that? And Peter says, Here's the way to do it, with respect. He uses that word, he says submit. Do you know what submit means? It means to yield. Uh, how many of you uh, have your driver's license and you drive? If you do, great. You know there's a triangle sign, and it is, has some red on it, and it says yield. When you come to that, now I'm going over this because I've noticed not all drivers understand what this means. Uh, do you know what, what does yield mean? You slow down, look both ways. If there's somebody coming on the main thoroughfare, they have the right of way, okay? Somebody in the earlier service said, what does yield mean? And the guy said, speed up. <laughs> That's not what yield means. In some countries, we've been... Uh, uh, I've had quite the adventures and misadventures driving in other countries, but their yield signs don't say yield. You know what they say? Give way. That's a pretty good way to say submit to authority, yield to authority, give way to authority. You're submitting, you're giving way to authority. You're respecting it. Now, what's Peter talking about here? He's talking about the government. He's talking about people in authority over our lives. He's talking about elected officials, talking about parents talking about um, spiritual authority, uh, God, government, parents, bosses. Uh, we're to treat them with respect. Now, I know some of you are saying, but Jim, you don't know my boss. You don't know this elected official. Listen, here's the thing. If you can't respect the person, you can respect the position, Okay. Now, some of you, you, you're having to deal with this, and, and I, wanna, I wanna add a little caveat here, because uh, sometimes I think people see this and they think, well, what if I'm in an abusive relationship? You know, am, I, am I supposed to stay with my, my spouse? I think if you're in an abusive relationship, you need to get out. Uh, you, you can still respect the position by not trashing them all over Facebook or whatever, but if you're, if you're listening to this, you're here or you're, you're online, uh, if you're in an abusive relationship, you need to, you, we'll help you. Um, me and some guys will come over to the house and we'll, we'll have a talk if we need to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but don't, don't miss the principle here. Um, there are people that we don't respect as individuals, but they're in positions of authority. The way of the disciple is to show respect. When we're immature, we're often demanding our rights about selfish things. If, you're, if your food doesn't come at the restaurant exactly when you want it, do you complain and whine and why, woe is me, why am I always serving? If you get a red light, 
on Watson Avenue. Why are you against me, God? You know, we can come up with, we can think of all these things. But there, there really is uh, a thing we, we, we need to, to kind of take it. That, that leads us to our, our next one. How do we react to suffering? We expect it, we accept it, at least to a certain degree, and we endure it. I'm not saying there's not a time to stand up, but most of us stand up for the wrong reasons when we've been wrong. Suffering, hardship, tough times is part of following Jesus, okay? Can I just say, let me say that again. This is, this is not the fun part of the sermon, I know, but this is what Peter is telling us. Listen, if you're gonna follow Jesus, you're gonna go through tough times. What did Jesus say? If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Look at this in 1 Peter 2. This suffering is all part of what God has called you to. <laughs> if you wanna know what God's will for your life is, part of it is suffering. Why? There are probably a lot of things that are mysterious about it, but some of it is to help us grow and to become mature. Christ who suffered for you is your example. Follow in his steps. We're so quick to get upset. We're so quick to make our prayers, prayers of comfort. Me too, man, I'm working on this. How do you deal with suffering? Is your first prayer, God, get me out of this? Or God, what do you want me to learn from this? Do you remember the old story? Um, I think I told this before. A little boy found a cocoon out in the woods and he brought it home. Uh, he and his mom and dad looked up on the internet and it turns out it, it looked like the cocoon of a, a, a particular type of moth, a Cecropia moth. And I uh, said, can I keep it? Can I, can I put it in a little jar and let's do it? And the parents thought that was a good little science project for him. So we put it in the jar and every morning before he went to school, the little boy checked the cocoon to see if anything had burst out. Every day, when he, as soon as he got home from school, he ran in to see. And it just went for days and days and days and days. It looks like nothing was happening at all. And finally, what he saw was this little moth, like, like a butterfly, was trying, struggling, having a hard time busting through this cocoon. And the little boy, thinking that he was doing something good, he got some tweezers and he pulled apart the cocoon so the little moth didn't have to struggle anymore. But later on, when the moth put out its wings, he noticed it didn't fly, it didn't fly, it didn't fly. It, it couldn't fly. And they looked it up on the internet to see what in the world was going on. And it's, it was talking about the development of this. And it said, when you, if you have, have a little cocoon, be sure not to interfere during the struggle when the moth is trying to get out because that struggle is essential for the development of strength in its wings. Is that an aha? It was for me. So sometimes the stuff that you're going through, God's not punishing you. He's trying to help you learn how to fly. Sometimes you've got to go through some of the struggles of life to toughen you up. This is the way. This is the way of the disciple. But man, sometimes, we're, especially now that we have social media, people, have you noticed this? People are whiners and complainers. That's not the way of the disciple. People are so quick to accuse, so quick to blame, so quick to make excuses, so quick to sue one another. Oh, you want to hear a dad joke? A doctor and a lawyer were at a party. And if you're in medicine, you know this probably happens a lot. A lady comes up to the doctor and says, man, I'm having trouble with my shoulder. And she goes through the whole thing, gave all of her symptoms. And the guy's kind of like, man, I'm, I mean, we're at this party. But, he, but kind of to get the lady to go on, he said, well, here's what you should do. You know, and he gave her a little uh, advice and said, you know, if it keeps hurting, you know, come by the office, et cetera. And she finally walks away after about 15 minutes. And it's like, Whew. the doctor turns to his lawyer buddy and says, I know we're at a party, but should I bill her for that? And the lawyer says, you absolutely should. You should do that. So the next morning, the doctor went to his office and he uh, sent a bill for $200 to the lady that talked to him at the party. 
and he felt pretty smug and good about it until about 30 minutes later, he got an email from his lawyer friend for a bill for $500 consultation. <laughs> this suffering is all part of what God has called you to. Sometimes we're so easily offended. Let me ask you this. Don't answer it out loud. When was the last time you've just taken it? When somebody talked behind your back, when somebody did you wrong, when somebody accused you falsely, when somebody just didn't treat you right? Do you feel like you've got to, to make it right every time? Jesus, remember what it says, verse 15, or verse uh, 23 says, he left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. Jesus remembered, this life is temporary. I'm only here for a short time. My audience is God, and he's gonna make everything right one day. Peter says, this is the way the disciple deals with temptation. Run away, responds to authority. We show respect. And how do we react to, to suffering? We expect it as part of life, we accept it, and we endure it. And one of the reasons Peter said to do this is because people are watching. People are watching. People that don't know Jesus are looking at you, saying, hey, I hear he's a Christian. I, I hear he's a disciple. How's he gonna handle that temptation? How's he respond to authority? How's he gonna deal with suffering? What's your thermometer? Do you know the story? Let me end with this. Have you heard of Alfred Nobel? You know that last name, right? The Nobel Prizes. Alfred Nobel, you may or may not know this, he was a very wealthy man in the 1800s. And do you know why he was so wealthy? He invented dynamite. He invented dynamite, which was a safer explosive from nitroglycerin that they, uh, they, they were using. Dynamite easily led to weapons development. Alfred Nobel's life was changed one morning, living in the 1800s, when he got up and he was thumbing through the morning paper and he saw his own obituary in the paper. You know what the obituary is, right? It's a little sentence about a person that died. Now, obviously it was a mistake because he was reading about his own death. The mistake was his brother died and the reporter got it mixed up, but the reporter had written this obituary and said the inventor of di dynamite, uh, the he was a millionaire, multimillionaire, even in the 1800s, and that's when a million dollars was a million dollars, people, okay? It went a long way in the 1800s. And he was a manufacturer of weapons, and in the obituary, it called him the merchant of death like Tony Stark, remember this? And he read his own obituary and he said, this is how I'm gonna be remembered? This is how I'm gonna be known? This is what people think of me? And you know what Alfred Nobel did? He changed his thermostat. And he said, I don't wanna be known for that. And he gave away his millions. And you know what, remember what he started? the Nobel Peace Prize. Alfred Nobel changed his thermostat, and you can too, with the power of the Holy Spirit. How do you deal with temptation? How do you deal with authority? How do you deal with suffering? If you score low on that, don't beat yourself up. Just say, Holy Spirit, help me change the thermostat and help me to act like a disciple. Help me walk in the way that Jesus wants. We're going to conclude with a, a prayer. Listen, I want everybody, there's some next steps on your outline. I will take the temperature of my spiritual maturity by assessing how I deal with temptation, authority, and suffering. Look at this this week. How do I do this? It's a, it's a mark of your spiritual maturity. How about this one? I will purposefully remove or stay away from things that tempt me to sin. 
I will look for ways to show respect and appreciation for people who are in authority. When I have difficulties in suffering, I will ask God to help me identify with the suffering that Jesus endured. Today, I commit my life to Jesus for the first time. There may be some of you here, some of you watching online saying, I don't wanna just be a part of the crowd. I wanna be a disciple. I wanna follow Jesus. Maybe some of you need to say, God, help me with this temptation. God, help me with how I treat authority. Help me when I go through suffering. Help me to walk in your way. Would you bow and let's pray together? Father, thank you so much for loving us the way that you do. Thank you that you give us your word to teach us, to train us, to instruct us in the way that we should walk. If anybody's here, you don't have to raise your hand, but you can just kind of do it in your mind, in your heart. If you're here and it's like, you're thinking, maybe I've been a church person or I've, I've, I've been around church or I've always respected God, but I'm not really sure if I'm a disciple. Why don't you pray a prayer like this today? Say, God, as much as I know how, I give myself to you. I commit my life to you. I wanna be a disciple. I wanna be more like you. I wanna be like Jesus. Forgive me of my sins and come into my life. Maybe you wanna pray about one of these three areas. Maybe you wanna just say, God, help me with this. Help me to respond in a new way. Help me change the thermostat on my life and to live in the way that pleases you. Lord, wherever we are, help us to take a step toward you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
so much for being here today. If you are a first-time guest, we want to share some information with you. We have something right down front here. It's called Harvest in Five. We just want to give you a little bit of information. We love you guys. Whether you're watching online or you're in the room, God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.